This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 367 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, Kentucky Performance Products, and EcoVet. Today we have a great show that includes an interview with National Para Equestrian Champion Pam Harden. Judge Sue Colstad takes us through second level through the judge's eye, and Olympian Jacqueline Brooks join us, joins us for a trainer tip. Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. So you guys had a fantastic horse show last weekend. Congratulations. Well, it's been very busy. Yeah. But at least at least the busyness is sort of, you know, pay, paid back through some we had some great rides, some great tests. I was riding pretty good. My students are doing awesome. And so um yeah, I'm just really happy about our show, and and we're on to the next one. Just getting geared up, man. Yeah? yeah, don't you have you you show again next weekend, right? You're off this weekend. Off this weekend. Well, yeah, I'm coaching at a show this weekend, and then I'm, okay. we're going back to another um, national show next weekend. I'm excited because it's also a CDI being held, which is the last uh, place where Canadian riders can get qualifying scores for the Olympic bids, and it's a it's sort of a head to head battle going on for the last spot um yeah so looking forward to seeing seeing that seeing some great dressage and trying to do some better than mediocre dressage ourselves and <laughs> having great weather so, so, and having a great time it's been fun tell us a little bit of I, I i don't know what is the canadian qualifier like what's the deal on that well it's just a cdi in which you can obtain scores okay. so um it just happens to be the last cdi will be held in canada here um, you know, the people have been trying to obtain scores, um, all over the place, you know, through yep. competitions in Wellington and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, it's not like a national championship or anything like that. It's just, okay. um, you know, there's, uh, one spot is being filled by Belinda Trussell and Anton nice. has been doing yep. amazingly. Just, uh, yep. they've been continuing to set some Canadian records with, uh, that combination. So they're going pretty much for sure. And then uh, awesome. the next spot is uh, just a little bit more contested. We had lots of riders in the 69, 70%. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're hoping to get you know some last big scores to put them over the top to see who will be going. So I think it's... So you have uh, two riders that go? How does that work I, I, for Canada? You have two spots or how does that work? Um, we earn two individual spots through uh, same process, you know, qualifying scores. Got uh, it. Against, uh, you know, against... The I, it's very complicated. Um, I'm sure I don't completely understand, it, but you know, since uh, the U.S. has a team filled filled spots with a team because of the results at uh, the Pan Am Games, and so uh, we've had a bunch of riders trying to qualify um, individually. So, got it, got it, got it. That's cool. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, that'll be a really fun show for sure. Well, we are really looking forward. We have a horse show this weekend. So we leave tomorrow and uh, I'm doing the fourth level freestyle with E-Link Corp, uh, which will be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. We put all that work in. We might as well enjoy it, right? So uh, yeah, that'll be yeah, super cool. fun. So that'll be great. Well, right after this commercial break from Eco. Vet. We're going to come back with Pam Harden. She is a great lady, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy. She is now the uh, national champion for grade three para dressage. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if your horse could enjoy a zone of repellency from pesky flies? Well, he can with EcoVet. EcoVet is an entirely new type of fly repellent that is safe for horses and those applying it, offering a real alternative to toxic pesticides like pyrethrins. EcoVet confuses an insect's normal directional ability, the bug's GPS, if you will. So if it can't locate your horse, it can't bite your horse. Dr. Wendy Ying from the Driving Radio Show has been using it in South Florida, also known as the Jurassic Park of biting insects, and she just loves it. 
EcoVet's active ingredients are naturally occurring food-grade fatty acids that have been clinically shown to improve the condition of horses with difficult-to-treat sweet itch problems. EcoVet is effective on mosquitoes, ticks, noceums, as well as flies. You can visit EcoVet online at eco-vet.com for more information or to order. You can find EcoVet at Dover Saddlery Stores and EcoVets on Facebook. Just search EcoVet, E-C-O-V-E-T. Well, tonight I am so happy to have my new friend, Pam Harden. She is now the national champion for grade three para dressage. And she and her horse, Quarterback or Snickers, uh, stayed with us. Carter, Carter Jack. We just talked about this, Reese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I call him Snickers. He was Snickers to me. He is going to be Snickers to me forever. But uh, Snickers, they stayed with us on their way up and on their way back from the national championship. Pam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Philip. Very excited to be here. Where was the national championship held? It was at the Waterloo Hunt Club in Michigan. Great show, great to show there. I've never been up. Yeah, it's a far piece from South Carolina and Georgia, but (laughs) Reese was so kind to let us stop and rest and relax and take a breath on the way up and on the way back. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> well, we had a big time, and it was so fun to have you and your trainer Mel- Melanie with us. It was really a lot of a lot of fun, and we learned quite a lot about you know you and, and Snickers. So tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and and how now you got to the national championship. Well, I think we should start by saying it's the national championships for the para equestrian. So I'm disabled. There are. Five levels of disability. Would you like me to do a little bit yes, of kind of please. background? Yes, please. That would be great. Yeah, okay. yeah that would be great. Right. Thank you. So we are graded um, internationally at this level. You get graded, and they determine by your disability whether your tests include just walking or walking and trotting, walk, trot, and canter. And there are five different different levels, 1A, 1B, 2, 3, and 4. 4 being the least disabled, I'm a 3 which means that I have um, disabilities in more than one section. So one of my arms is six and a half inches shorter than the other, and I can't lift or straighten it, and uh, I have very little feeling in it. And then I, my brain was crushed at birth, and so my lower legs are about a second and a half, especially my right, a second and a half behind my, my brain, and I have a little bit of balance issues because of it. So that puts me in a grade three. And um, they grade us so that we can actually compete against each other. Uh, our scores. So I'm, I was the national champion for grade three, but I actually ended up being the national champion out of all the grades in the national show. Okay. I didn't know that. Because we can, what? We can compete against that. each other. <laughs> I did not know that, everybody. It was great. We did a cheers just for the grade three national champion, but now I'm like another cheers for that. Good girl. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, And we did uh, selection trials at the same time, but I'll get into that later. So we, we get to what's nice is we have similar experiences, you know, yes, some of us may be more disabled than, than others. um, But because we can all compete against each other, it kind of levels that playing field. And we get to do that because we use dispensations, which is uh, something we get from USEF to use specialized equipment. So I didn't know anything about that when I first started. I didn't know anything about paradressage until December of 2013. Melanie, wow. It, my, Melanie Mitchell talked me into a clinic. <laughs> I love it. And, but you had a long career before that in horses. That's right. right. I did. Um, but with, uh, not with dressage, um, I started out in Girl Scouts. I grew up in New York. I joined the Girl Scouts so I could ride. I stayed a Girl Scout for, well, till I was 18 so that I could ride. 
I sold Girl Scout cookies out of my locker. <laughs> so I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you were selling them still. I would buy them. Oh, That's God. The best. Me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So what made you, so you started, you made the switch. And so tell us a little bit how that switch happened and then how you ended up sort of now getting uh, stickers and moving on to where you are now. Well, I, I wanted, always wanted a horse. So after I had my last child, um, I decided I would start having horses and I got Arabians and got my kids into it. We all showed together, um, which was great fun. Although I always finished last because I would lose a stirrup. I would lose my reins. I'd go off here, there and yon. And so I wasn't very competitive, but it was so much fun because we were all doing it together. And it was just a family, you know, great thing for all of us girls to do together. Um, and then my children grew up and they started to have lives of their own. And I was left with these horses and I had gotten a young horse and Melanie was helping me with that. And she said, oh, my golly, this Arabian must do dressage. And I said, well, I don't do dressage. And she said, oh, yeah, you will. You will. <laughs> <laughs> And she was right. She took him, we took him to a show where I was showing him, you know, in the main ring. And she said, well, let me just take him in a couple of dressage classes. So she did. And he won all of these classes. He won high point for the weekend. He just cleaned up. And I thought, okay, maybe I've been in the wrong place all this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we kind of started with him. And, and I did a couple of tests, although my Arabian just, never really took my disabilities well. Horses either take it well or they don't. There is kind of no middle ground. Um, and he just really didn't, or, and still doesn't, really enjoy them. And so I did show him um, a little bit. And when I, I went to a clinic out in California that was all about paradressage. We didn't know anything about it. Melanie Mitchell and I flew out there to try to figure it out. And they let me, they lent me a horse that was capable of doing, you know, kind of I one sort of things. And they let me play with it for the weekend. And I found that I could do it because he was, he was a para horse. You know, he was able to do those kinds of things. And he took my disabilities and I figured out I could be competitive if I had the right equipment. You know, I, if I had something where I didn't lose my stirrup all the time or my reins didn't drop out of my hand and that I got the bug came back and said, okay, what can we do? And I started showing the Arabian and I leased another horse. And, and while that was fun and I learned a lot, especially leasing the other horse, I knew I wasn't, I would never be, you know, competitive nationally or internationally. And so I started looking for another horse and that's where Snickers comes in. No, he's um, so cute. I know (laughs) he is. And he's the (laughs) sweetest thing, just the sweetest thing. Um, Kai Hand, the chef to keep of the para team. Um, I had done his clinic with him and ridden one of his horses at one time, and and so he had he sent he was sending me videos here and there, and he sent me a video of Snickers, and I said, oh, ooh, ooh, yes, this one, this one, I'm interested in, yes. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, you're going to have to get over to Germany fast, and I said, well, I've never been to Europe, and he said, well, this is where the horse is. Yeah, you gotta go get them. <laughs> yeah, now you get on that plane, girl. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I was worried he wouldn't vet out. So I said, you know, if we're gonna go over there, I'm gonna go to the Spanish riding school and I wanna go see some castles. Yeah. So kind of included that <laughs> the in the trip. Experience. Love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we the very first second I got on it, Melanie ran in first and she kind of did all the fancy things, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was wonderful. And so when I got on him, his his movement is so big. It's so much bigger than anything I'd ever been on, anything. And when I got on, he immediately said, oh, well, you're not ready to ride this yet. Okay. And he just like backed off. He still did walk, trot, and canter, but he didn't do the huge things that he was doing with Melanie. And that immediately said to us, if he's got the heart and the mind for it, to say, okay. I can back off till she's ready. And the more I get, the better I get, the more he gives me, the bigger it gets. The, you know, the loftier that trot is, the more extended that, you know, 
met the canner in the truck. I mean, it's just amazing. He's just fabulous. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. So now tell us, how was how did the national championships go? There are three days of tests. Um, you do a jog like you would a CDI, and and uh, everybody has to make it through the jog. And then there are three days days of tests. The first test, the first day is a team test, and the second day is the individual test, and the third day is a freestyle. Um, so the team test is usually, you know, it's, people say it's the easiest for me. I don't like the team test as well. I, the individual to me is, is a lot of fun, and of course the freestyle. Um, and the the first day, uh, the night before national championships, raccoons were in yes. the stalls. <laughs> this is not funny, but it's kind of a funny story. But it's not funny. It I've never funny, heard this yeah. before. Oh my gosh! They tore up right you know in our tack room, right next to Snickers. They tore the place apart. They got uh-huh. into our plastic tubs and ate every piece of sugar we had. Oh it, they, they tore stuff up and started to carry it out of the stall. And so when I got there, Snickers was pretty wound up, you know? <laughs> it was a yeah, little, it was traumatic. Little I was stealing your sugar. Yeah. And there had been a well, joke. There, there had been a yeah. joke. So you've been here at my farm, and we, we have had a little bit of a raccoon problem. And so I thought, <laughs> maybe you just took one from here and put it in your tack room. Because that, that was I kind know. of between us. So I was like, oh, you just went from here to there. It's totally normal. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. We have yeah, caught so eight at this point. Eight. Ahead. That's a lot. Eight's a lot. We've caught eight raccoons at this point. Yeah, that is a lot. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, so sorry. We had a raccoon, so we no. have laughed about the raccoons about I love it. It's so funny. So yeah. <laughs> but he was a little worked up, but but you know, we had a good test and um did you know, did we we, you know, kinda wanna do he was a little more distracted than I was hoping for the first day, but then the second day we came out in the individual test and I really felt like really we did well. I, I knew we did well. I knew what we did better than the day before. And I had him, he was on my aids and, and he was, you know, he, I just knew it. And then going into the freestyle, we got horrible weather up there and terrible footing because of it. Um, and, but he went, you know, they, they did everything they could to make that fitting, but they went out and they moved the arena some to, uh, to fix everything. And, and we went out and it, I don't say it was our best ever freestyle, but it was, it was good enough to win national championships for the week. <laughs> oh, that is so Fantastic. cool. Yeah. So what's the plan now? What happens with picking the team for Rio? Well, we've been told not to speculate that the selection committee um, takes these scores from this weekend and goes back and looks at everything else you've done, uh, your scores from the beginning. And, and that, you know, for me, I'm the youngest team um, of anyone competing at this point for selection trials. We, we've just been together the least amount of time. And of course, when you first start showing a horse, those aren't your best scores, you know, so, but they go back and they kind of see your progression. They look at what you've done. And they will pick a team. I don't know how they do it. I know there's like 25 people on the selection committee, so it's a bunch of people that have to get together. But mm-hmm. they will, um, they will let us know next week. Fantastic. And they will pick a team. Uh, and I, I don't know. I, I this is this is more crazy than I've ever thought. I never thought I'd be in this kind of situation. So I, I don't <laughs> have any experience. I don't have any any knowledge i feel like a a babe in the woods when it comes to this i'm always saying oh really i didn't know that i say that a lot <laughs> <laughs> that is so exciting though i mean i mean oh, I, I i hope you go to rio because we will be cheering you on like <laughs> crazy are you kidding me i absolutely love it well pam oh, thank you i know you i have so- you in my corner i know that <laughs> oh yeah thank you sure. so pam <laughs> tell us um you know as as and you were very kind we were ch- chatting off air um i have a student that we had a meeting with or dinner when you stopped by and she's she has had a head injury and and you know we've been kicking around sort of trying to get into para and it is it, it dressage and it is a, a difficult um gosh something to navigate so how would you sort of you gave us some great advice on sort of if there's somebody out there that that needs to or would like or is interested in para how, how are some things that you can get involved with with the whole organization 
Well, uh, the first thing to do is start to look into dispensations, and you don't you don't have to think about competing on such a wide scale, uh, nationally or internationally, right off the bat. What you want to be able to do is is go to your local shows and do the parrot test. And to do that, you want the specialized equipment. Mm-hmm. And so probably the best place is, you know, you want to start by by looking at what kind of equipment or quite kind of uh, help you might need. Um, you can go through Maureen Johnson, who is the high performance director at uh, USCF, or you can go through USPEA and Hope Hand, who is the president there. Um, you can email me. Um, Pam Harden at psh13 at comcast.net. Um, but but it's, it, it is hard to navigate because when you start, you're not sure what's available as far as um, equipment or specialized things. One of the things that's on my dispensation that I can use, not just in para competition, you can use these things in able-bodied competition. So I don't have to release my reins and salute. I salute with my head only. I nod which is a dispensation, which allows me to compete in the able body doing that. So I don't have to let go of my reins and then try to get them all back. And my left hand doesn't get it. And, you know, and then, you know, you've lost the first couple of movements. Mm-hmm. So it's not just equipment. Sometimes it's, you know, those sorts of things. We have um, Sydney Collier who has um, a vision problem and she goes out and has um, kind of markers, you know, out outside of the, of the arena that tell her where she is during her test. So there's lots of different things you can use, but if you don't have somebody to give you guidance, it takes you a really long time to figure that out. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely suggest getting in touch with, you know, probably anybody. I, I know the team. I know everybody's been competing. I'm sure any of them would be thrilled to give you information. Um, if you, you know, look us up, we're pretty easy. Um, to get to get to get to know. Ah, fantastic! Well, Pam, thank you so much for your time tonight, and we are have our fingers and toes crossed, even if we're not supposed to be doing it for uh, the announcement <laughs> for Rio. We're we're really excited for you guys, and congratulations on a fantastic win last week. Right after this commercial break from Kentucky Performance Products, we're going to come back with our special. Uh, segment of the summer, as we like to say, uh, we are coming back with Judge S. Judge Sue Kolstad to talk about second level and from the judge's perspective. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Electrolytes. Who needs them? Your horse, that's who. Electrolytes perform critical functions within your horse's body. They help regulate nerve and muscle functions by carrying electrical impulses between cells. In addition, electrolytes assist the body in maintaining a healthy fluid balance by controlling your horse's desire to drink. When your horse loses significant amounts of electrolytes and fluids, problems such as dehydration, muscle cramping, fatigue, tying up, and colic may occur. Even in mild forms, these conditions can have a negative impact on your horse's ability to perform and recover after exercise. Top riders and veterinarians turn to Summer Games Electrolyte to keep their horse healthy in hot weather, and you can too. Summer Games replenishes the electrolytes and trace minerals lost when your horse sweats. And it stimulates the thirst response so your horse continues to drink and stay properly hydrated. So when the going gets hot, trust Summer Games Electrolyte from Kentucky Performance Products to protect your horse. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. This evening for our continued segment, our Through the Levels with a FEI judge, we have Sue Kolstad. She is an S judge and an FEI rider and trainer. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you, Reese. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we, we 
are so happy you could come on because Philip and I are really happy and excited about this segment. Um, I have to be honest, I personally learned a ton from our last segment, the last two that we've done, and I'm looking forward to the same thing tonight. And um, we gave you, we, we are talking tonight about second level. So uh, get us started if you don't mind. Tell us the purpose of second level and what are some things the judges are looking for? Well, the purpose of second, of second level is to see that the horse now accepts more weight on the hindquarters. We call it that collection. And the horse should move with more of an uphill tendency. And we're asking for medium gait for the first time. At first level, it's a lengthening. But at second level, it's a medium, which means it carries on its haunches. And it's almost an extended gait but in a collected frame. That's how, kind of how you would differentiate between a medium and an extended. And then we're looking for more bending and suppleness and throughness. We want more self-carriage than first level, and the horse should stay in balance while it performs all the movements. So this is really the first time that collection is ever asked, right? Right. My trainer always used to say dressage doesn't really start until second level because that's when you have collection and that's when you're required to sit the track for everything. Yes, for sure. Good point. Good point. Yeah. And that is a good Mm -hmm. point because I actually had a student ask this question. And and so you may know, I could not find it. I just had the USEF book, but I could not find where it specifically said that you have to sit the trot, but you have to sit the trot. That that was yeah. that was a big one. She, she, we had a slight uh, argument. I was not argument, but I said no. Really, you, I know you. I know we can't find it anywhere, but everything is done in sitting trot. So I think that's a good um, reminder. Uh, and, well, and maybe- if you look at the if you look at the, um, the the directives in first level and training level, it says sitting or rising. So when, but yeah, it doesn't so when you say that have, when it doesn't give level. the option, it means sitting. I guess you're right? sitting exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. And and that's why a lot of people, I mean, I'm sure you see this a lot. I mean, second level is a big jump from first level. There's a lot of things. What are some? What it's are a some giant things? step. Yeah. It's a giant step. And in the judging world, it is probably the level that is, um, I don't know how to say this. It's not, the requirements are not met at this level, like they are at third and fourth level, the the collection. We just really don't see the competitors with collection at second level like we do at third. So the second level is a transition level, and the horses are just beginning to learn to collect, and the riders are just beginning to learn to collect and do medium gates. And when they get to third and fourth level, we actually do see collection, but it's rare to see collection with the second level of course in competition. That's interesting. That's an interesting point. Yeah, that is. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So tell us what are some movements, some new movements that we will see at second level? Well, in second level, we have shoulder in and in the track, we have travair and travair would be haunches in. We have 10 meter circles and we have in the canter, uh, counter canter, we have serpentines with counter canter, and then we have simple changes. And simple changes are probably the most difficult thing for the horse to perform. It's not the up transition, but it's the down transition. More transitions are seen with trying down than with actually cantering down into the walk. And then in the walk, we have Halt rain back, and we have turns on the haunches. All right. Well, it's, it seems like we have a lot to cover yeah. here for our, our new a movements and the move. different yeah. things. Yeah, second level. So maybe we'll start with, I think test one has um, shoulder in almost in the beginning of the test. So maybe you can talk right. to us a little bit about common mistakes with the shoulder in and common mis- misconceptions. One of my and, favorite subjects. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah, and second level test one, it starts with a medium trot across the diagonal, and there are also transition scores. 
And so I'm going to talk about that before I get to the shoulder okay, in. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great. And yeah. Transition scores are cut in half. So the judge keeps track of the first transition, which we call the up transition. And then the judge keeps the medium gate in mind, comes to a score, and has a score in mind for the up transition. And now there's the down transition in the corner. And we add that transition to the up transition score and divide it in half to come up with a score. Most horses go into a medium trot with some degree of power, but they tend to fade when they come back to the following corner. And they fade and fall on the forehand. So if I have a seven medium trot and a seven transition into the medium trot, and then the horse just kind of dies to a five, I can give the medium trot a seven, but I have to give the transition score a six. Yeah, very good So riders need to really think about transition scores. And what am I looking for in that transition at the far end, the end of the medium? I am looking for the horse to engage into the collected trot, not be pulled back by the rain to slow down and come into the corner on the forehand, which is what I see more than not. (laughs) If the horse shows me a better balance as it comes through the turn and across the short end, then I can go up on my transition score. I can actually go a score higher on the transition than the medium. So that's something for riders to really think about. Yeah, that's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Very Details, good point. right? That's a detail point. Right, exactly. So then after the medium trot with two transition scores, and when I teach my students, I always tell them, okay, we have a transition score on this. Because I want them to be aware that they have two scores coming up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a mark, yeah. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so then we go into the shoulder in. We come through the corner. And what do I see mostly for shoulder in? Neck bend. <laughs> yes. <People think> <laughs> bend is in the neck instead of the body. If you have a relatively straight neck and the horse on three tracks, so there's angle, with very little bend in the body, the inside hind can come under, engage, and you can receive it in the outside rein, and the horse can show an uphill balance, which will get you a great shoulder in score, a great score. But most of the time, I either see way too much angle, I see four tracks with a gap in between, or I see a straight horse with neck bend. So those are the two biggest flaws that the riders are producing in shoulder in, which affects their scores. It affects when a I lot. When I see a very yeah. little bend with a fairly straight neck and just, just positioning, just a little bit of flexion to the inside, mm-hmm. then I know the bend is uniform through the body. Yes. Not more in the neck. And mm-hmm. then the horse goes uphill, and then I can give them give it an eight or even higher. Excellent. We love it. Then so, when you go to turn, then, then it's shoulder in right, and um, it would be E, turn right, B, turn left. Keep the shoulder in position to make the turn. Do not straighten the horse and then turn. Keep the bend of the shoulder in to make the turn right, and then Produce a bend when you turn left and keep the bend from the turn into the shoulder in. But when you finish the shoulder in at M, straighten the horse before you ride the corner. That, that is how it is scored and judged. Another thing I would like to mention is every test has directive ideas next to the box, which gives the movement, like track left, medium trot, collected trot. And 
in the directive ideas is the criteria that the judge uses to come to a score. And the riders need to be more aware of that and read those directive ideas so they understand why they get the scores they get. What are the things the judge is looking for in each of these movements to arrive at a score? Very good point. Yes, read those direct. Read it at the horse show. You're just sitting around. Pull it out because it, it really. And I, I have to I have to say something because uh, I did not read those directive ideas until I did the learner judge program. And I am so embarrassed to say that, but no, nobody ever told me like, "Hey, there's another that, column." That is nothing to be embarrassed about. Though. It's, <laughs> it's something that is missing in our education. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like a across the board, across yeah. the board. And it's unless not- the trainers have gone through the L program and learned that, they don't take that to their students. Now, nope. one thing I do when I judge is I have my scribes go into the directive and underline and circle things. So you read it. (laughs) So that I draw the attention to the directive Mm -hmm. when the riders put their chest back. Yeah. No, everybody should read them. Yeah, you should just read because it really makes sense. It's like, oh, and the shoulder end, this is what they're looking for. And you can kind of self-diagnose a little. Well, I got a six because I I did this at a sufficient level or Mm – so I, I know. I think that's great. So what else is in second level? That's I think one. maybe we should flow right into the halt rain to the halt rain oh, back. Yeah. Love it. Some common problems here because it, it occurs in the next move for the for test one. Right, right. Well, the halt and the rain back and the transition out of the rain back requires three separate parts. First, we have the halt. And a lot of times horses start to learn the movement. And as soon as the rider comes to the halt, the horse knows they're going to rein back and the horse starts to rein back before it's told. If the rider does not establish a halt, and the halt should be three seconds. Now, it is not written in the directive that the halt is three seconds. I, the, um, the entry halt and the final halt says three seconds. But you should halt and stand there. You must establish a halt. And I, as a judge, would rather see a rider correct the horse and not let it get away with backing up than just go with the flow and try to smooth it over and let the horse back up. So we have the halt. And let's say I, I think... I'm thinking eight. Let's say I'm thinking eight because it's pretty square and it was well written. It doesn't have to be square to be a, to be an eight. It has to be correctly written, and that means that the horse comes from behind and halts the hind legs, and then the front legs stop, and then the horse stays on the bit attentively. Doesn't go above the bit. Doesn't go behind the bit. It's not quite square. I can still be thinking eight because of quality. Then, in the rain back, the horse should back in diagonal pairs willingly. And they teach us in the judges program that it should feel like it's a forward movement, that it should have the activity of a horse going forward. So the rain back should be with a forward attitude and diagonal pairs. If it If it braces or blocks or starts to kind of back with one leg and then the other, it still backs up, and I can still, you know, feel kind of good about it, but it's it's not of an eight quality if it's not diagonal here. If the horse ducks behind the bit, then I can take a half a point off. Then it should ideally pick the last foot up to step back again and go forward on that. And then we've got above an eight. Very good. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that sounds pretty clear. Yeah. All right. Well, again, we got a lot of stuff to get through for second level. So let's talk about the Travair. The Travair. We'll jump to second level okay. test two. Yeah. Travair is haunches in. And it should be for tracks. It should be more angle than shoulder. And people don't realize that very often. 
Yeah. So when yeah. we have the trial there, we want the horse's front legs going straight on the track. We want it looking straight so there is bend to the inside. And then we want the haunches to come on an inside track, and there should be four tracks. So it's actually more angle than shoulder in. Ah, that's a big one. That's a really important mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what are some common right. things that you see instead of Traver? You see a lot of head-to-wall leg yield, I think. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> the things I see instead of Traver are very creative. <laughs> okay, okay. Mostly and, uh... what I see is a straighter horse or a horse really resisting. Racing in the neck, resisting the bit, hollowing. And not want, and then inconsistent, like it'll come in and go back out and come in and go back out. Very, very few horses are supple and fluid enough to do a really correct travers. It is the one movement that I think is the most seldomly seen correctly ridden. Yeah, I think it's sort of one of those moves that separates the the second level horses from each other a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well let's move it's on. It's really half on a different line. Yeah. About it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what we try and think about. Yeah. It's hard. It. It's hard if you haven't ridden, you know, if you're training a horse for your first time at this level or something that it, uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it is hard. So how about the canter so, work? What are some things in the canter work? Okay. The canter. Well, First of all, the candidate part is from the walk now for the first time. And what we want to see is not a horse kidding, anticipating before you ask. And the way it's written, and it says, um, from a medium walk, short and stride, canter. So basically, when they say short and stride, they really want, they're allowing you to collect the walk before you go into the canter department. We don't want to see haunches in. We don't want to see the horse above the bit. We don't want to see any chop steps. And what we do want to see is the horse lift up. And we want to see the shoulders come up. And I'm just going for my memory, but I do believe just about every one of the canter departs is going away from the judge in the far corner. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. There's one at the edge. Yeah, I think there's one, yeah. Right. I'm just getting all the tests mixed up. In yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our world. But when there's a canter depart away from the judge, and all I see is the hind end of the horse coming into the corner letter, I wait until I see the horse come through the corner because that's when I see the balance. Mm-hmm. And if I see a really good balance, I add to the score. Oh, that's interesting. So that's something to really think about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. But haunches in, we don't want haunches in. We don't want trap steps. We don't want the horse to come above the bit. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that the rider must really work on. And not jigging and not anticipating. Mm-hmm. And how about the counter canner? What are some things you're looking for in the counter canner? In the counter canter, we want a balanced canter. And when the horse is in the left lead, its body is slightly bent to the left. Mm -hmm. And when it goes to the right in the left lead, it must maintain a slight degree of bend to the left on the arc of the line of travel. And it's not a big bend, and I don't want to see the neck bent more than the body. I do want to see a slight positioning, but not a turning of the head to the, to the direction of the lead. And then the horse must maintain the same balance from the true lead back to, through the counter lead, and then again back to the true lead again. Yeah, no, I think balance, that that's great. Balance and maintaining the same bend equal, equal on the loop. Yeah, that makes sense because a lot of people over flex the horse and then they're off balance. Right. <laughs> and then and, it doesn't work. And if, if I'm a rider 
And I feel that the horse is going to change leads on me. And I have to overbend it one direction to prevent it from changing leads or push the haunches more out to keep it from changing leads. I'd rather sacrifice the quality and get a five or a six than take a chance on having the horse change leads on me and there I'm doomed for a four or lower. Mm-hmm. So sense. as a rider... You have to think that way because a lot of the horses at second level really are not ready for the degree of balance in the counter canner. And, you know, I'm a trainer, I'm a rider, I'm a competitor, and I'm a judge. And so I look at showing a horse and competing a horse from that process. So if, if the serpentine loop is supposed to be three equal loops, three half circles, and now I have to jump the gun a little bit and say my biggest pet peeve on the serpentine is the riders go into the corner on the serpentine. And the serpentine is a half circle, three half circles. Do not go into your corner on your serpentine. Go into the corner before and after, but not during the serpentine loop. But let's say my horse has trouble in the counter canner loop. If I make the true canner loop, a little bit smaller and allow more time and room for the counter canner loop and I sacrifice a little bit of geometry for the sake of making it easier for the horse, I'm still going to get a higher score than if I take a chance and I try to ride it exactly according to the requirements of the geometry when the horse can't handle that. Yeah, that's a good tip. That's a really good tip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I love it. And the judges are just so happy when they don't break, let me tell you. Yeah. I mean, I what ride, happens? What's the score if they every break? Horse with, with, with everybody I did, I ride the horse with them. And I can see it before it happens. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, push the hunches a little more. Don't let the horse break. Please. Yeah. I'd rather give them a six or even a 5.5 than have to go down to a four or lower. Got it. So, Sue, the one last thing that we wanted to chat about was the turn of the haunches. Can you talk to us a little bit? What are you looking for in the turn of the haunches in second level? Okay. In the turn on the haunches, it is allowed to be larger than a pirouette. When I look at the turn on the haunches, I want to see that the rider really knows where the hind legs are and has control of the hind legs, and the the outside hind steps toward the inside shoulder. It should not cross in front of the inside hind because then the inside hind has to step sideways to get out of the way. But so many riders do almost a turn on the haunches, I mean forehand, and they let the haunches swing out. When they let the haunches swing out, they are not meeting the criteria of the movement. The haunches must stay on the inside track, and then the shoulders should come around with bend to the inside, bend position or flexion to the inside. Mm -hmm. And so the inside hind must pick up and set down and keep stepping forward. So we want to make sure we keep the rhythm All four legs walking with the correct sequential footfall, and then that they have control and they direct them all toward the inside of the small circle that the haunches take and the larger circle or half circle that the forehand takes. Fantastic. Yeah, those are great. That's a great tip. And that's that's another biggie in second level. So as you can see, second level is a huge level. And I think it's crazy. there's so many new yeah. things. Oh, so, so many, many new things. things. And so many and new things when happening you quickly. The turn on the, on the haunches, don't overturn the shoulders. Oh, that happens so much. Or if you come off the line and you see that you've come a little wide, don't sidestep back to the line. Walk straight <laughs> Just walk back straight. to the line. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's a big one. 
That's a big one. Well, Sue, thank you so much for helping us tackle this at really, really difficult level and, uh, and the great tips. I, I love them. And, and we're showing, uh, we have a couple of students showing second level. So this weekend, so I'm going to personally, literally, I wrote notes and I'm going to tell them the notes as well. So Sue, how can our listeners find you online? Uh, I don't have a website anymore. I discontinued my website. So I guess just Facebook. Great. And that's just under Sue Colstead. Yeah, that's it. Fan- fantastic. Well, Sue, thanks so much. Thank you, Reese. I enjoyed speaking with you, and I hope your students do great this weekend. <laughs> thanks. Well, we are super ha- happy with these segments, and Phil, I am learning something at each one of these segments. Every time, I mean, you Every never, time. you can never know too much, I suppose. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Well, and-, and judges, you know, we don't, we don't spend enough time with judges. You know, we really don't, and or or and or talking about specifically judging. So I'm I'm enjoying these segments, I think, as much as everyone else as well. And uh, we're going to come back now with our total saddle fit tip of the week with Canadian Olympian Jackie Brooks. The Saddle Fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the Shoulder Relief Girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. At totalsaddlefit.com. Visit totalsaddlefit.com. Well, tonight it is really an honor to have Jackie Brooke. She is two-time Olympian from Canada, and she rides for Brookhaven Dressage and rides my favorite horse, Goose. Welcome to the show, Jackie. Thank you. I'm happy to be on it. Well, Goose's real name is De Niro, right? But his name it is Goose. Oh, he's so cool. And you guys have such a wonderful partnership. But we have been trying to get you on the show, and we're so happy to have you tonight. <laughs> well, thank you. You can thank Phil for that. Ran into me at the horse yeah, show I, and I, nailed was, it down. I bugged her and bugged her and bugged her. Until I knew it. I've it. tried. I've been trying to bug her for years. So, Phil, well done. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you. And, Jackie, you are doing our Total Saddle Fit Tip of the Week. So, what should we talk about tonight? We've got lots of stuff to talk about. Yeah, I was trying to think about that, you know, about when you are uh, talking on the radio to a wide audience and, uh, you know, and everyone has different problems and different uh, horses and different situations. So, uh, you know, I think the best thing that um, I would recommend is that uh, you, one, try to get the best training you can get. And two, you educate yourself really taking advantage of how many wonderful videos there are on uh, on the Internet now. I mean, you can really spend many, many hours educating your eye and really focusing on what it is we're actually trying to do. No, it's so true. So tell us, I mean, as you said, we, this is a wide range. And, and certainly uh, when we're lucky enough, the riders that get to go to Florida, you get to have that sort of intense training. But, you know, once we come home and I'm also in this for, or, you know, you have great training and then you come home and it's, it's tough. So how do you recommend people get some good training if they're sort of in a remote area or somewhere that doesn't have someone? Yeah, so certainly clinics. And, you know, finding out where those clinics are, you would be, I think, very surprised how many clinicians come through and, um, and how often, you know, I, I'm, I travel all the time teaching clinics and, and I go to pretty remote areas in Canada to do it. So, you know, you may be surprised there's someone worth the drive um, to get to. And, you know, if you're, that, if you're that far out that there's not that, then maybe you, you plan, you know, three or four times a year, you treat yourself to a trip to, you know, wherever you can afford to go um, to take in some of these, you know, if, you, if you're really fortunate, you, you can, you know, you could fly to Europe and take in some of these master classes 
that are offered by like Carl Hester or by you know by um, Edward Hall or any of those guys. And if you know if you you can't afford that or you don't want to use your vacation time for that, then you know look uh, look you know in your state or in your province or in you know somewhere that you maybe see a seat sale on. I know New York is full of clinicians, uh, New Jersey, all those you know meccas where dressage is popular. Um, and really choose, you know, you can pick and choose then what you, what you, who you would want to learn from. And, uh, and my advice in that is to get on the internet, get on YouTube, watch people teaching, watch people riding. You know, if you see somebody riding the way you think you would like to ride, then go and find out what they're doing to, to ride like that. So Jackie, my question is, and, and you are such a wonderful person and you get to know you and you have such a great smile and you're so kind. So what would you give advice? Let's say somebody, let's say I'm in a remote area and I'm really looking forward to having a clinician or I really, really want to come and talk to an Olympian like yourself. What would your advice be for, for me yeah. to come and, and yeah, how, would I, so- how would I schedule a clinic? You know, just, just the basics of that. All those basics. Well, if you um, if you're in an area where you have enough horses to support a clinic, uh, and you know enough otters that you could support bringing someone who, you know, because of course the more knowledge somebody has, of course it costs a bit more to have them come. Um, so the first thing would be, can you afford that clinic? If you can't afford that Olympian, find out if that person has a barn, you know, a barn manager, or a writer, or somebody that rides with them at a very high level that maybe would be more affordable in your area that would teach the same system that that person is teaching. So, you know, for an example, like, you know, you have Ashley Holzer, four-time Olympian, amazing instructor. If you couldn't afford her, she has a number of um, students under her, like Brittany Fraser, who's gone to the Pan Am Games, is trying for the Olympics, Chris Von Martels. They would come at a, you know, a more affordable price for sure. And then again, if you really, you don't, you're in such a remote area that you don't have access to really affording an entire clinic, find out if that person would allow you to come to their barn for a couple of days and just sit on their, in their arena and watch you teach your, your own lessons. Yeah, I I, I was just thinking about that, Jackie, is that that you could travel and, and spend a few nights in a hotel close by and get so much experience from just being in that environment. I know that, uh, you know, a lot of the big barns will have, you know, lots of lessons, lots of horses, you know, being yeah. ridden, and lots of training going on all the time. Lots of training. It's, yeah, and it's it would it's just would be such an experience to kind of soak that up. Yeah, exactly. And if you came, so say someone came to my barn and they came for a couple of days, sat through all my lessons and stuff, and then they decided, oh yeah, they really like the style and they like you know the way we treat the horses. Then you know we have stalls. You could bring a horse for two days or three days and have your lessons here and. Maybe spend your money getting yourself educated that way, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and I think, yeah. I was just going to say, that something that I do um, on occasion is if I have a, a person that's in a remote area, they'll send the horse for a month and come up for a week of that or come up intermittently yep. through the month or, you know, just however they can make it work, that the horse gets some training, then the person gets some training, they get to learn a little bit uh, apart, they get to learn a little bit together, and, and, and that, that can really work for a lot of situations. Yeah, and you know, and I, I really believe, you know, that that the train getting good training and getting good instruction um, is more it's more important to have that than to spend all your money on a, on a more expensive horse. Mm-hmm. Like take take the money you can afford to buy a horse, split it in half, get a nice horse, but get training because otherwise, you know, the the training lifespan in a horse is not that long. You know, we have them competitive for not that long so it goes by fast and if you don't get them trained early enough then you know you're missing an opportunity that you could have with that horse yeah i, I yeah especially drawing attention to I, you know for me and, and my horses i think um the most important years are you know the four five six year old years when you know they're kind of young and they're ready to learn and they're eager and their bodies are willing and they build muscle fast and you know the joints work all really well Instead of the years yeah, you know, where everybody seems to want to focus their training when the horse is 13, 14, 16, you know, when they start to get to the, you know, the FEI levels. And, but it's, it's a little bit almost, it's not wasted, but it's like if the horse had learned some of these things very early on in their basic training, you wouldn't have it to redo it when they're older and a little more 
a little more tired uh, or you know they just don't have mm-hmm. the energy and the flexibility that they that they had in their younger years the same as riders riders are always saying oh i wish i would have picked this up you know 20 years ago i would have been a lot better at it, it i think it applies to the horse if you think about it almost as much or if not a little bit more yep i agree well i, I agree think, and it, no go ahead jackie i was going to say too and there's sort of critical uh, levels you know you get a young horse and then, of course, you put the basic the basic gates on it, walk, trot, canter, and it goes on your age, and that's exciting. And then sort of the next milestone is, you know, that it goes a little bit sideways, a little half pass, a little shoulder in. And then if you can really get help until it does a flying change, it really that really changes your your path with that horse. You know, once they put, you can really put a change on them, the training, it does get easier for people to do it on their own. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. And and those milestones, you know, flying changes, maybe tempi changes, piaf and passage. I mean, there's certain times half steps where and stuff. Half yeah, steps, like- yeah, that you need to have someone with you. Uh, plus, you know, I and I know you guys feel this way also as is trainers and but we're riders and we have goals and to go somewhere and just focus for five for for a week or, or two weeks just really focused with you and your horse, it, it sort of, for me, helps bring that sort of inspiration back. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, great. You know, you know, kind of that check-in with my trainers. It, it just does so many good things for me, and it's fun. And, you know, I bring my horse, and, and I do the same thing. And I, I kind of leave all my, my students at home and, and go for camp and, and really enjoy that. And I think that, that that's an important thing that all riders need. And, um, and I think, the biggest thing that Jackie you're so good at is it's not that intimidating. I think it, people get very intimidated going to speak to a, a a good instructor, but you really shouldn't be. We're all in this to train horses and have a great time and and help people learn and um you know so I hope that people really take all this to heart and and really think yeah this is this is great and and I really could go to that person's barn or if you like the way someone rides you know, give them a call or, you know, don't obviously, you know, nobody wants anybody being annoying, but, you know, don't be afraid to give someone a call or send an email because I think we all, uh, wouldn't you say that? Wouldn't you say that? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Or I approach them at a horse show, you know, and they're, they're, you know, not in the middle of their warm up right before they go in the ring or anything, but you know, the <laughs> yeah. day, the day before when people are training people, you can, you know, you can sit by the ring, you can see a lot of training that way. You can really get to know a little bit the personality of the trainer that way. Maybe introduce yourself, you know, have a start a relationship with that trainer. Then you can really, yeah, I think we're all in it for the same reasons, and we're all we all came mm-hmm. through it the same way. So yeah. I think that any trainer is going to relate to where you know where you are on that journey, and think you know that was me. I was the one sitting you know outside Robert Dover's ring at 20 years old, watching three lessons before I went and rode my horse, so that every day. I was, you know, trying to learn what is, what exactly is it that I need to try to do today, you know? Yeah. And I think in the, we live in a wonderful world of social media and, and YouTube where, like you said, you can watch a lot of lessons from home and, uh, and you can contact people, you know, via email or Facebook, you know, all these different ways that you can sort of get yourself out there. You can there. really go. And, and there are sites specifically designed for that. There's, you know, the dressage training online site, there's, there's play, there's there's uh, you know uh, Tristan Tucker has a, a program going now where you can learn to do all the groundwork. There's lots of places you can go uh, on the internet to to learn how how to train horses. But I would also say even when you're doing all that, if you think you're at first level or second level, keep watching the great riders that you really know. You have the picture in your mind of really where you're supposed to be going in the sport. And that you see the end result all the time. So you know where you are on that path as well. That's a great tip. Yeah, really, really important, you know, not, not to only watch what you're, what you're doing, but what, where you want to be going. Because uh, yeah, for that, sure. that'll help you to, to give the picture the, uh, to the horse, the, the end picture and, and what you want to be doing. And, you know. Yeah, you know. You're trying to, you know, when you trot around in a training level or a first level test, you know, I always try to say to people, you can trot like a Grand Prix horse. That, that what's difficult about being a Grand Prix horse is piaf and passage and, and uh, you know, doing one tempies. Not the, the canter can be the same. So if you can canter a 20 meter circle, you're in training level. If you can trot a leg, you're in first level. And as the degree of difficulty is what you add to those gates. But if you're watching, Grand Prix horses go, you know, the top in the world and you see the self-carriage and the, the shape and the, 
you know, that where you want the pole and where you want the, you know, the head at the vertical or where you want those hind legs to be. And you're trying to emulate that even in training and first level, you're doing a far better job than thinking that it's a diff, something's different about the way you're supposed to trot your horse compared to the way they're trotting their horse. Yeah, no, it's so true. And it's so, it, it really is inspiring. And, you know, if you ever can get to Florida or, you know, and see Jackie ride under the lights, I mean, it's just really a cool feeling and, and you want to be there. And, and, and it's true. You can really educate your eye. And, and the more you watch, the better you get, just even from, from a knowledge standpoint. So Yeah, absolutely. But, absolutely. Jackie, thank you so much for your time tonight. We enjoyed having you on the show. And how can our listeners find you online if they have any more questions? Uh, yeah, we have a website, uh, brookhavendressage.com. And so there's a contact us uh, button on that. So anyone that uh, wants to get in touch with us, that's, that's the easiest and best way. We love email and Facebook shout outs. Don't be shy. Philip and I certainly aren't. And we love it when you uh, contact us and give us some questions. So anytime, feel free to send us a shout out and we'll try to answer the question and or find somebody that can if we can't do it. Well, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. The best way to contact me is through Facebook, Philip Parks, and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on a show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you next week.